Okay, hi. So in this talk, I will be talking about timing attacks, uh, as was mentioned before. Uh, but talk, timing attacks, they're actually not new. So they've been known for decades. Uh, and uh, well, but as Bob Dylan env envisioned in the 60s, uh, these timing attacks, they keep on changing. Uh, so in this presentation, I will focus on uh, how these uh, timing attacks have changed over the last few years, and mainly with regards to uh, web security. Uh, so I can mainly skip the slides uh, because of the introduction. Uh, so uh, timing attacks, they're a type of side channel attack, uh, which means that you don't directly infer uh, information as you would in a SQL injection attack, for instance. Uh, but instead, you uh, observe information from your environment and use that information to derive a secret or other private information. So I've, as I've said, these attacks, they've been known for decades, and they have mainly been applied in the crypto world. Uh, and there, they, they have been used to retrieve cri cryptographic keys or uh, encrypted messages. Uh, but also to exploit uh, secure connections, uh, for instance, uh, exploiting SSL with the Lucky 13 attack. So the concept of the timing attacks are, is pretty straightforward. Uh, so first, in the first step, the, either the attacker uh, performs an action or he makes the victim, victim perform an action, and then the attacker measures the time from a certain starting point uh, which is specific to the system that he's attacking uh, until a certain endpoint. And well, he measures the time how long it takes, and then he compares or analyzes this timing measurement. And that's basically all he needs to uh, launch the attack. So in my research, I uh, well, was looking at uh, examples of timing attacks, and I came up with uh, a new type of timing attack namely the drunkenness timing attack. Uh, so in this timing attack, we will try to determine whether a certain person is drunk or not. And in order to do so, uh, well, we will go to that person and we will slap him, him or her in the face. Uh, and then we me measure the time it takes, so the second step uh, from uh, well, the time we slap them uh, until they slap us back. And if this is a short uh, time interval, this probably means that the person is still alert and thus not drunk. And otherwise, uh, well, it means that the person is actually drunk. Uh, but of course, I'm from the academic uh, environment. Uh, and I can't just start claiming things without real evidence. So that's why I performed an experiment. Uh, so I found myself a test su subject uh, who wanted to re remain anonymous. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that didn't happen. So I went to his place and I wanted to know uh, whether he was drunk. Uh, so what I did is I went to him and I slapped him in the face. Uh, so at that point, I started my timer. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, and then you can see that he jumps up quite fast <laughs> and uh, slaps me back. So he slapped me back in a little over three seconds. Uh, so to come back to the question whether my test subject, Matthias, is drunk, well, probably not. But of course, that, well, at that point, we have just a single measurement. We don't have anything to compare it with. So that's why I did, uh, well, I extended this experiment and I used the second part. <laughs> so for the second part, I, uh, well, had, uh, I wanted to have like a predictable value. Uh, so I uh, gave some beer uh, to Matthias and made sure that he was drunk. So then again, I uh, performed the same attack. So I uh, went up to him. And again, uh, I slapped him in the face, uh, which is again when I start my timer. And as you can see already, uh, he's, he has a lot of trouble getting up. 
but in the end, well, he slaps me back. So now it takes uh, more than eight seconds. So because this value is higher, uh, we can infer that Matthias is actually drunk at this point. Uh, so the timing attack worked. Uh, and basically that concept, uh, so the concept that I explained before, uh, can be applied to all types of timing attacks. So with the drunkenness timing attack, you measure the time it takes for the person to respond, so to slap you back, uh, and that's related to the well to how drunk that person is. Uh, and the same goes for uh, recovering a cryptographic key or message. So then you measure the execution time of a certain algorithm, and this depends on whether a certain bit of the message or key is a one or a zero. And the same goes for the lucky 13 attack, where you uh, measure the time it takes before you get the TLS error message. Uh, and that's related to uh, whether the padding of that message was correct. Uh, and using that information, you can uh, use some mechanism to uh, decrypt or to retrieve the plain text information. And it also works with web-based timing attacks. So, Web-based time attacks, they're also not new. Uh, they've been known uh, for 16 years already, uh, so since 2000, uh, which, well, in the context of the web is a very long time, I think. Uh, but well, recently they've been, uh, well, there have been new types of attack, attacks. So in 2013, uh, Paul Stone uh, presented his work at Black Hat uh, called Pixel Perfect, and he found that uh, after applying certain SVG uh, filters, uh, the rendering time of the GPU would be uh, related to the color of a pixel. Uh, so using this attack, he could infer what information was on a certain, uh, well, in a certain iframe. Uh, also in 2013, uh, Eduardo Vela found that uh, if after a post message, uh, the victim or well the well yeah the victim uh, makes some uh, uh, comparison in JavaScript, uh, the execution time of this ex uh, uh, of this uh, comparison uh, is related to the input of the attacker uh, and uh, secrets some secret data. And then there are uh, two other attacks. Uh, which I think have mainly been known in the academic circles. Uh, so there's the direct time attack where the attacker directly sends, for instance, login uh, request to the server and measures the time it takes uh, before an error is returned. And using that, he can try to uh, use a well, smart brute force technique to recover the password of the user. Uh, and then there's uh, the cross-site timing attack uh, which will be the main focus of this talk. So cross-site timing attacks, they're quite different from uh, these direct timing attacks because uh, instead, well, here the request is not sent by the attacker, but instead uh, the attacker triggers the victim uh, to, to make the request. And then the attacker measures the time it takes for this request to complete. Uh, and well, because of the way the web was built or created, uh, even for cross-origin requests, by default, cookies are attached to this request, uh, which means that uh, the response that will be returned to the victim will be specific to the state of the victim. Uh, so a simple example is if a user is logged in, uh, he will get a well, for the same endpoint, he will get a very large response containing the dashboard or other type of information. And when the user is not logged in, uh, he will get back a small response. And uh, because it takes much longer to download a large response, the attacker will uh, know that the user is logged in or not based on the time it took to download this resource. And you can simply uh, well, use the error event 
of an image tag, for instance, to uh, measure uh, the time this takes. And uh, well, this type of attack somewhat viola violates the same origin policy because the attacker is able to infer information about a cross-origin resource, uh, which should be prevented by the same origin policy. Uh, and just because it's so important, uh, I will briefly go over uh, this same origin policy. So it's one of the main security principles on the web. Uh, and basically, it states that uh, a website from origin A uh, cannot access any content from uh, origin B. So attacker.com cannot read any content from example.com. Uh, but not only the content should be hidden, uh, the length of the responses that are returned should also be kept secret. Uh, because uh, if the attacker has just uh, this knowledge of the length of uh, the response, uh, they can infer already a lot of private information from the user, uh, as I will demonstrate later. So how do these attack how do these cross-site attacks uh, look like? So here we have our user, uh, which is Robin. Uh, and Robin is regi registered on a certain social network. And the social network consists of two groups, namely the Batman group and the Joker group. Now, on a certain day, uh, Robin is browsing the web, and he goes to a certain website, uh, for instance, a news website, which is not malicious. But uh, this news website happens to have, well, happens to contain a script from a malicious advertiser. And this malicious advertiser is trying to show targeted advertising to the user based on whether this user belongs to the Batman group or the Joker group. So the advertiser here will try to determine of which group uh, the user is part of. So uh, just with JavaScript, uh, the attacker initiates a request uh, and measures the time it takes to download it. So you can see, because well, this user belongs to the Batman group, so for the Batman resource, uh, a lot of large response uh, is returned. Uh, so the attacker measures that it took a uh, little over four seconds. And then he does the same, but then uh, for the Joker group. And because the user is not part of the Joker group, only a small response is returned. Uh, and as a result, uh, it took uh, much less time to download this resource. Uh, so in less than two seconds, uh, this resource uh, was received by, it, by the user. Uh, so the attacker then uh, compares the measurement of the first, so for the Batman resource and for the Joker resource. And he sees that, well, for the Batman resource, it's uh, much higher. So then he can infer that this user belongs to the Batman group. But of course, this only works in very ideal situations where this user is on a very reliable network. Because in a more re realistic scenario, uh, the request will go over the internet. Uh, so will the response, and there might be network congestions. Uh, so in the end, the, well, the time it took uh, to download this resource is definitely not re reliable. Uh, and thus, uh, well, you can see that here it took se six seconds, which was uh, larger than for the Batman resource. So in the end, the attacker didn't manage to learn anything. Uh, so next to the network irregularities uh, from which these time attacks suffer, uh, there's also the, the, the limitation when uh, gzip compression is used. So when gzip compression is used, the difference in resource size will be much smaller, uh, which will mean that uh, it will be even harder for the attacker to differentiate between the two resources. And for every measurement, so one solution uh, for the attacker to do here is obtain multiple measurements and then 
apply some statistics to infer the actual value. Uh, but uh, in order to obtain more measurements, uh, the attacker will need to trigger a, a request with the victim uh, every time. Uh, so if there's rate limiting enabled on the web server that's being attacked, uh, well, this attack simply uh, won't work. So in my research, I looked at different types of time attacks. And I, next to the drunkenness time attack, I also discovered these browser-based time attacks. And these time attacks are quite interesting because they can overcome all of the limitations uh, of the classic time attacks. And the main reason for this is that uh, the timing measurement only starts after a resource has been downloaded. So uh, no matter what network congestions there are, uh, they don't affect the timing measurement at all. Uh, and to on top of that, the measurements that are obtained are uh, much more accurate. Uh, and even for some of the attacks, uh, well, I will go into the details a bit later, uh, but for some of the attacks, uh, a resource only needs to be downloaded once. Uh, so even if there would be rate limiting, uh, well, it won't affect uh, these timing attacks. And also because uh, well, we can cache a certain resource, uh, it's possible to obtain a lot of measurements in a very short time interval. So coming back to the previous example, uh, these browser-based attacks look like the following. So there's the request and response, but as you can see, only after the response has been uh, returned uh, does the attacker uh, start his timer. So these browser-based timing attacks, they exploit a certain si side channel. Uh, so the attacker will measure the time it takes for the browser to process a certain resource. Uh, and with processing uh, resource, uh, this can be done in three separate cases, uh, in three separate things. So either trying to parse a certain resource in a specific format, uh, for instance, at a, as a video, and then the attacker can measure how long it is, this takes for the uh, victim CPU to uh, finish. And then the size of the resource will be related to the processing time of the CPU. Uh, and the same goes for storing the resource into the cache or reading, uh, reading it out from the disk. Uh, so the attack is surprisingly simple. So uh, this uh, few, well, these few lines, they're uh, all that's needed to perform this attack. Uh, so basically you create a video element and add two event listeners on them. Uh, so you add, the suspend, add a listener for the suspend event and for the error event. Uh, so the suspend event will fire as soon as a resource has been downloaded. And that's, uh, well, that's when the attacker starts his timer, so he uses the high performance timer. Uh, and then the, well, after the parsing has been done, the error event will fire. Uh, and that's because, well, the attacker is not really interested in knowing the size of a video, but rather from, well, he's more interested in knowing the size of a certain HTML response, uh, which is uh, not a video, so it will return an error. And basically then he sets the source of this video to start uh, the entire attack. And this attack can be even improved. Uh, so you, well, the attacker can add uh, a certain, uh, well, can use the application cache mechanism. So he basically uh, creates this app cache manifest, uh, which says that uh, this resource, so the resource he wants to estimate the size of, uh, will be added to the cache, and for all the rest of the resources, they can simply be loaded from the network. Uh, and using this attack, uh, the resource will only be downloaded once uh, with the application cache, 
And as soon as that has been done, uh, it can be parsed over and over again to obtain a lot of measurements. Uh, another attack we found is a cache storing attack, which al is also not that complicated as you can see. So basically, the attacker creates uh, well, a, a request uh, and puts the right cred credential. Uh, well, puts the right options. So the credentials should be included with this request, uh, which means that the cookies need need to be attached uh, with the request. And uh, well, the attacker also doesn't want to use the uh, cross-origin resource sharing mechanism, so that's why I put this option here. Um, and then, basically, he fetches this request, and uh, once this is done, uh, well, he can again start his timer, and then uh, place it into the cache uh, for some bogus request. And uh, once it's placed into the cache, he can uh, stop his timer again and measure the time it took to, uh, well, to write it to, to write the resource uh, to the disk. Uh, and again, uh, this can be executed multiple times without uh, downloading this resource again, because uh, well, here the response can be cloned. So you can put clones into the cache over and over again. Uh, so how well do these attacks uh, perform? So we, uh, again, did some experiments where we measured uh, the average time it took to differentiate between uh, two files. And the difference of those two files in kilobytes is on the x-axis. Uh, so for these classic time attacks, you can see that uh, for resources smaller than uh, 15 kilobytes, it was not possible to differentiate between uh, these two files. And also here, where the difference in file size was uh, 40 kilobytes, uh, you can see that this thing is missing. And that's probably, well, most likely that was because there was a small network interruption on our university network. Uh, which made that this attack simply failed. Uh, and I should also mention that uh, in this graph, uh, well, the classic time attack uh, is already favored because our uh, university network is relatively stable. So these, well, these classic time attacks, they should relatively perform well. Uh, but then if you look at uh, the new types of time attacks, so the browser-based time attacks, uh, they significantly outperform these other time attacks. So, uh, well, the best performing one is the, the video parsing one where you use application cache to store the resource into the cache. Uh, and you can see that even when the difference in file size is very small, uh, this attack uh, still managed to differentiate between the two files. Uh, in a, and well, you can see that it was much less than one second. So that brings me uh, to the demonstration. So in this demo, uh, I will particularly focus on Facebook. Uh, in our research paper, which is publicly available, uh, we also discussed several other attacks against other major vendors. Uh, so. Uh, Facebook has this uh, ability for Facebook pages to limit the visibility of a certain post. So, for instance, uh, I can target my posts only to, well, I can make my uh, posts only visible to users who are in the age of uh, 20 to 30, for instance. Uh, and when, well, when you're trying to access uh, this post while not being uh, well, part of this uh, group, this target audience, uh, then you will get back a small error message saying that you cannot access the content. So in this attack, uh, we will try to discover the age of the victim. Uh, as, uh, so the first step 
of this attack uh, requires some uh, well, creating of uh, Facebook posts. Uh, and these Facebook posts are uh, well targeted uh, to a specific uh, to users of a specific age or age range. So uh, the attacker creates posts that are only visible to users uh, in the age of uh, 13 until 22, 33, 32 until uh, 4. Yeah. So. Uh, so uh, each post is targeted to users in a range of 10 years. Um, and also some, well, to determine the exact age, the uh, attacker creates posts that are only visible to uh, users of the age 13, 14, and so on. Uh, so in the actual attack, uh, the, the, well, the attacker will perform one of these uh, browser-based timing attacks. Uh, so he fetches the corresponding resources and then obtains uh, timing measurements for them to estimate their size. And based on the size, uh, he will try to uh, determine the range, range of ages that the user is in. Um, and then uh, lastly, he will repeat uh, this, well, the previous step uh, but then to determine the exact age of the user. Uh, so I've made a small proof of concept for this. Uh, so here on this graph, you will be seeing uh, box plots that are moving around. Uh, and these, well, when a box plot moves, it means that a new measurement uh, was obtained for that, uh, for that, well, for that resource. And the resources are located on the x-axis, so there's a Facebook post that's only visible to people of the age 13 until 22, uh, 23 to 32, and so on. So first, the attacker downloads the resources, uh, which is completed quite fast because there's only six resources that need to be downloaded, so it's in yeah, less than one second that this happened. Uh, and then he will uh, use the cache storing attack. Uh, so the cache storage time is on the uh, x, uh, the y axis. Uh, and then he will start collecting measurements. Uh, so as you can already see now, uh, for the second resource, uh, so the Facebook post that's only visible to users of the age 23 to 32, uh, the measurements are significantly higher. Um, so the attacker uses that information to infer that the user is within this age range. Uh, and then he will repeat the same experiment. Uh, so you can see that for the age of 26, uh, so in 20 seconds, uh, this value, well, these values are uh, much higher than for all the rest. Uh, so, yeah, in less than 30 seconds, uh, the attacker manages to disclose my age, uh, which I think is quite unfortunate. Uh, but even more unfortunate is that well, these attacks are not just limited to Facebook, uh, but we looked at several other uh, vendors and basically uh, I don't think we encountered one that was not vulnerable to this attack. Uh, so on LinkedIn, it was uh, it's well, it is possible uh, to obtain information about your connections. Uh, on Twitter, uh, the attacker can see uh, who you are following, uh, and well, in some cases, can even infer the identity of the current user. Uh, so. Also, Google allows you to search your uh, own search history. But of course, if you can do this, the attacker can do so as well. Uh, so on Amazon, uh, it's possible to uh, look at your his shopping history. Uh, and well, the attacker can see what you shopped for and well, do useful things for that. Uh, 
on Gmail. Uh, you can browse your inbox. Uh, well, you can search your inbox for a certain query, and the attacker can also do that. And he can determine whether a certain query returned results or not. And well, there's other research uh, being done about this, uh, well, this case in particular, uh, and they show that well, it has some pretty nasty results. So I hope that by now I've convinced you that these attacks are pretty severe, and well, I think they should be mitigated. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, mitigating these attacks is uh, well, very hard, uh, and the main uh, reason for this is that uh, the side channels that are exploited by these browser-based time attacks, they are, di they are there by the design of the browser and the web in general. Uh, so a naive solution would be to reduce the resolution of the timer, uh, but unfortunately that won't work either. So uh, in my examples I use the high performance timing API, uh, but in fact a resolution in the order of one millisecond is already sufficient. Uh, and a thing that we as security aware people can do is uh, to disable third party cookies, because if the cookie is not attached to the request, well, the response will not be related to the state of the user. Um, but, well, we know that well, browsers offer the opportunity to do this, uh, but there are millions, if not billions of people who are not uh, well, security conscious and they just might uh, not do this at all. Uh, so uh, there's also a possibility to not only look at the client side, but also try to mitigate these issues at the server side. And there we can make the observation uh, that the cause of these attacks is related to cross-site request forgery. Uh, and we can try to mitigate these uh, attacks in a similar, fas similar fashion. Uh, so a solution might be to uh, well, have a CSRF token on GET requests. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, that brings along uh, a lot of other uh, problems. Uh, and yeah, I don't think it would simply work out of the box. Uh, another promising thing is the same site attribute on cookies. Uh, but I won't go into detail there because I think that my quest will be, be talking about this tomorrow morning. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, he authored this same site uh, attribute, so, well, he's the one to tell you about it. So, uh, to summarize, uh, when it comes to uh, cross-site timing attacks, uh, I, I think it's unlikely that these will be resolved in the near future. And, well, although it might take a while before these attacks are actually exploited in the wild, there are well, chances are that some evil hackers are sitting in this room and uh, that we'll all be doomed by tomorrow. Uh, so to conclude this presentation, uh, so I've presented some uh, new type of uh, timing attack, namely browser-based timing attacks. Uh, they're quite different from the classic timing attacks in the sense that they start the timing measurement after a resource has been downloaded, uh, which makes that they are much faster and much more robust than these classic time attacks. And uh, it's unlikely that these attacks will go away in the near future because the side channels that they exploit, they are there by the design of the browser and the web. Uh, and I've, all, well, I've shown just a few examples, uh, but you can believe me when I say uh, that many popular web applications are vulnerable to these type of attack, attacks. Um, so in the last part, I briefly touched upon mitigating these issues, uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's very challenging, and we are definitely not there yet. So now I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the question is whether uh, these attacks apply to stateless applications. Uh, I think the simple answer is no, uh, because well, if there's no states, then there's no information that the, that the attacker can retrieve. Uh, so yeah, I don't think these apply with stateless. Uh, yeah, so I've well contacted the browser vendor, so uh, well, Firefox and Chrome. Uh, Chrome said that this was a well, they well, I have a slide actually for that. Uh, so uh, Firefox said uh, well that it's not an issue that they can resolve on their their own. Uh, but they wanted to work together with the people from Chrome uh, to fix it. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen yet. Um, the people from Chrome themselves, they well, said that these attacks uh, are well, very similar to another report that they received, uh, which is the Spy in the Sandbox, which is about cache timing attacks, but at the level of the CPU which is completely different from these attacks. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think, uh, well, these things will be mitigated uh, by the browser vendors. Uh, I also have some responses from the, uh, well, from Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so, well, Facebook uh, discussed it, uh, but unfortunately they didn't plan to change anything. Uh, I think that LinkedIn didn't really understand the consequences uh, because, well, uh, they mainly mentioned that certain content is known to be public, uh, but there's a different thing between something being public and uh, some attacker knowing that the current user uh, well, has these properties. Uh, so, yeah, they're also not interested in fixing the issues. Next question. Uh, do you uh, governmental attack method will show this will be guarantee. So are there any attack attack method without using without using guarantee? Yeah. Uh, so the question was uh, are there any attack methods that do not use JavaScript? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. Well, I, I can say that there are none, uh, but we well didn't find any yet. Uh, but I think that well, if we if you don't use JavaScript, uh, then the only way to communicate back to the attacker would be to send requests. Uh, to the attacker, uh, which is also, well, there's, I think, some uh, work that was done by Mario Heiderich with some uh, attacks that are based on C CSS. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if you, uh, well, involve a server, uh, so that's not uh, local on the client side, uh, then you again uh, suffer from the network irregularities and network congestion uh, that might happen. Uh, so then I think it's better to, well, remain with this classic timing attacks uh, rather than these browser-based timing attacks if you don't want to use JavaScript for them. Uh, so the question was, uh, is this still applicable to websites uh, that are protected against cross-site requests for the attacks? And uh, again, the simple answer is, I think, yes, uh, because uh, cross-site requests for re, well, protections against cross-site requests for re are typically just on post requests, because, well, with cross-site requests for re, 
you only need to protect the resources that initiate some state change. Uh, but here you just request something, so you retrieve information, and that doesn't trigger any state change. So in typical applications, I don't think it would make sense to uh, fix those endpoints, well, to mitigate those, well, no, to create a defense mechanism for CSRF on those endpoints. Uh, so the question was if there's something publicly available to test those issues. Um, well, our paper is uh, publicly available, and well, as you can, as you saw from the slides, the texts are quite trivial. Uh, so yeah, you could create, well, recreate the same attack in five minutes or so. <coughs> but I do plan to uh, make available some kind of framework where you can test all the different attacks on your own machine on against the server that you choose. Okay. Thanks again, Tom. Yeah.